This is the In Context Podcast with your host, Karen Von Hippel. Welcome to this edition of In Context, Rusi's podcast with very interesting people. It's a pleasure to welcome Jane Marriott today, who has just stepped down from being the director of the Joint International Counterterrorism Unit at the Foreign Office and Home Office. Uh, it's a joint government body responsible for design of the UK's international counterterrorism strategies, and we'll hear more about that later. Uh, she has also worked in a number of hotspots, Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, Yemen. And in fact, Jane and I met over a decade ago when she was working for Ambassador Holbrook in Washington, D.C. And she's about to go out to be the U.K. High Commissioner to Nairobi starting this summer. So welcome, Jane. Thank you very much, Karen. It's great to be here. We always like to start these podcasts out uh, at the very beginning uh, in your childhood. And we seem to interview a number of people who are from Yorkshire, South or North Yorkshire. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure sh- sure why, uh, but tell us a bit about your childhood in, in South Yorkshire. Oh, my goodness. My childhood in South Yorkshire. It was great. Um, uh, my grandfathers were both coal miners, so it's very much uh, from Doncaster, very much a sort of working class uh, town, good solid values, and brought up by two loving parents uh, with a sister who I always tease is six years older and six inches shorter, Ah. uh, which is guaranteed to wind her up, which frankly is the job of a little sister to a big sister. So, and then you went from, how did you get interested in international affairs? Did you have a teacher who got you excited? Did you watch a movie? What happened? I think there's a whole generation of probably women about my age who have to, at this moment, go Kate Aidy and Tiananmen Square, thank you very much. Uh-huh. Um, and I was reading Ruth Davidson's uh, book a few weeks ago, and she also talks about the Kate Aidy Tiananmen Square moment as being a defining moment in her childhood, going, wait, hold on, we can do this sort of stuff. That is amazing. Kate Aidy is amazing. She is in Tiananmen Square reporting under fire um, as the Chinese crack down um, on the student protesters and she can do that stuff and for me as well it was that same moment where I'm like wow that's a thing that's a job you can do that Um, and so my natural interest in the world I've been that kind of nerdy spotty student who'd collected all the Sunday supplements about big environmental issues and made my own little catalogue and library of them Mm -hmm. Um, so quite nerdy from early on Um, and just seeing Kate Aidy do that made me think wow there's this world out there and I want to go and be part of that. But you weren't sure if you wanted to be a journalist or a diplomat or anything just you were interested in learning more. Just I think because the Kate Aidy model was the one I saw I went from that okay I would therefore like to be a foreign war correspondent and that was kind of the path that I had in my head probably until I was doing my postgrad actually and only then did it change to become something a bit different I mean as a kid from a regular comprehensive in Yorkshire I had no concept of this thing called the foreign office I had no concept of foreign policy I was 23 before I first got on an aeroplane uh-huh. so I had right. no idea about all of this right stuff. right no I think many of us I mean I grew up in Alaska and I was I had all these very naive assumptions about the world but I was also very interested even though yeah. when I look back I thought I could you know I think I was a little bit nutty. Um, so you went to uh, Durham University and you studied history and then you did an MPhil in international relations at Cambridge, right? Yeah, by editing the student newspaper at um, Durham because I was still thinking at that point I would quite like to do journalism. And I actually intended to do international history at Cambridge and Cambridge sent me the wrong prospectus. Oh. They sent me the international <laughs> relations MPhil <laughs> instead of international history. And I kind of looked at it and went... Oh, yeah, that, that's completely me. Let's do that. How so funny. thank you, whoever stuffed that envelope Who incorrectly all those years ago. Did you go straight from your BA to your MA or, or did you take any time out? No, I went straight from uh-huh. uh, one to the other. Was that normal or were people? Um, it was. So my course was probably about a third of people who'd done the same route as me and then about two thirds who'd had real world experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was quite interesting for both of us because, of course, we knew how to write an essay because mm-hmm. we'd just been doing it for the last three years. And then, you, but we had no experience in the real world and then all these fantastic real world experiences people who were like what's an essay again how do I do it what's the structure so we all complemented each other quite well right right I do remember that I was editing a book once and I asked someone who had only been a practitioner to write a chapter and he was very smart in Sudan and he sent me this 10 pages of bullet points and I just thought what do I do with this yes (laughs) put some verbs in there so then did you 
you, then you went straight into the fast stream. Is that what happened? How did you? Yeah. So, did, so I had did they recruit sort of, you, or well, I had a moment at Cambridge where I was still thinking about the um, foreign correspondent route, and I'd interned in that they don't really pay you way at the Times for a couple of summers, and then I didn't get on the Times graduate scheme. Uh, which sort of blew my world away because I really, really wanted that. And at the same time, I read an article uh, in The Guardian, an interview with an MP uh, who said, yes, I used to be a journalist, but then I decided I wanted to be the person making the news, Mm -hmm. um, i.e. not the person reporting on the Mm -hmm. news. And I thought to myself, actually, I want to be the person behind the behind the person making the news. (laughs) Funny. Uh, And my mum said, oh, why don't you uh, join the civil service? And we've talked about this since. And in her mind, she was thinking, you know, go and work for the Department of pensions and work right. and you know right. maybe come back to Doncaster right but I didn't I filled in the fast stream application form I didn't apply for the foreign office because it didn't occur to me that someone like me could do that mm-hmm. but I applied for the cabinet office and the ministry of defense and the ministry of defense failed to get back to me uh, I still remember that guys and the cabinet <laughs> office sort of said yes come and work for us uh-huh interesting but you didn't have to take an exam or anything like that yeah so there was uh there was sort of two three days there was a oh, sorry there was an exam and there was a sort of two, three days assessment board uh-huh. and then a final interview. Uh-huh. And I think I did quite well at the first two stages because at that point I didn't want to be in the civil service. Mm-hmm. I was just doing it to make my mum happy. And only at the final selection board did I think I really want this. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, because I really wanted it, I was really nervous. And I sat so tightly in the interview chair with a panel of about eight people that I didn't realise I got pins and needles. And when I stood up, my leg gave way and I fell over one of the interviewers. <laughs> but they still let me in the civil service. Elegant, elegant. <laughs> very yeah, very yeah. stylish, very Excellent. stylish. So, so you joined the cabinet office, but it looks like then you went to the foreign office and worked on non-proliferation issues. Um, I did. Virus into the home office, actually. So I had one of the few strops I've had in my career was I was the only female on our fast stream intake and all the wow. boys got to do foreign policy, so I got to do policy jobs mm-hmm. uh, in the cabinet office and I got to do equal opportunities for the senior civil service. And when I'd finished doing my equal opportunities job, they offered me a job that one of the boys had done as a first year job. And I went, no, screw you. Oh, I well want done. The, I want the foreign policy job yeah. and I'm going to the home office and I'm going to do a criminal justice bill. Call me. Um, when that job is free and I'm not coming back otherwise. I have no idea what came over me. Yeah. Um, I was, what, 23, 24 at that point? And I did. And then they did. They rang me and said, come and do this. So I helped set up the predecessor of the uh, conflict stability pool um, while I was in the cabinet office and saw a job going in the foreign office for nuclear non-proliferation, which had been my um, thesis subject in my post-grad and so I applied for that. Okay. And then you did that for two years, it looks like, right? Uh, you were the team lead. Just under three, yeah. So what, what exactly were you working on then? So that was working on particularly on the Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, Preparatory Committee and Review Committee. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I did, my boss was horrified after he'd hired me to discover that I had, in fact, been a student member of CND, the Campaign mm-hmm. for Nuclear Disarmament. <laughs> but I argued that actually this worked really well because it meant I knew how to talk to NGOs. Yeah. And was not unsympathetic, but ultimately government policy was nuclear weapons. So how are we going to work together? Because there were bigger issues that we could tackle if we worked together. Um, And so actually ended up developing quite a good relationship with the NGO community for that preparatory committee. And it was also the time when North Korea tested. Uh Um, So we had that crisis to deal with. Yeah. So you started in June 2001 and stayed through September 2003. And of course, 9-11 happened in that period. And so right after you started, so it must have probably overshadowed so much of what everybody was doing as well. It did. And there was obviously kind of the lead up to uh, the military involvement in Iraq as well, which didn't directly impact uh, me. But I had a sort of very, very peripheral role on that. But then you went out to Iraq pretty much after the war the war started in March 2003. Yeah. And when did the CPA and all that get set up in June, right? In June, although it wasn't particularly staffed. Uh-huh. Uh, and so when I arrived in Maysan province in southern Iraq in September 2003, uh, there still weren't any CPA uh, mm-hmm. people out there. Mm-hmm. It was the military doing a brilliantly valiant job, but without the expertise. 
So how many people were, were you one of these people shoved into an area and said, you know, you're the ruler type of thing? Uh, thankfully not, no. So I would, so the Foreign Office uh, had asked me to go out as part of the CPA and I'd mm -hmm. said yes, but then they screwed up the paperwork. And so at this point I'd resigned my nuclear non-proliferation job mm -hmm. and had nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And the Ministry of Defence rang me up out of the blue and said, would you like to go to Maysan and be a Polad? And I mm -hmm. went, yes, absolutely. I've just got two questions. Where's Maysan and what is a Polad? Yeah, right. And Maysan, of course, is a province halfway between Iraq, uh, Baghdad and Basra. And a Polad is a political advisor. And my job description was get to know the British commanding officer to whom you are attached, win his confidence and shoot the breeze with him over a whiskey late at night. But, but uh, uh, who was your commander, by the way? Um, so the main commander while I was there was a, a Colonel Pointing, Bill Pointing. OK, but that would have been... A uh, period when, I mean, your mother must have panicked when you told her you were going to Iraq, right? Uh, actually, my mum was fine. It was my dad oh. who panicked. So I'd also uh, got a job lined up with the International Atomic Energy uh -huh. Agency. Uh, and so I told my parents there was a strong possibility I was moving out to Vienna. Mm -hmm. uh, and I rang, I can still remember the conversation. I rang my parents up and uh, Dan answered the phone. And I said, oh, dad, can I talk to mum? And he uncharacteristically went, no, no, tell me, tell me. And I said, well, the good news is I'm not going to Vienna. <laughs> and he went, oh, thank God. Oh, oh, thank goodness. Thank goodness. And there's this pause while he clearly worked out something else was happening and went, why? What's the bad news? And I went, uh, I'm leaving to uh, go to Iraq in about 10 days time, Dad. <laughs> and, and he literally dropped the phone and I could hear him going, Pat, Pat, come and speak to your daughter. <laughs> But that, you know, I guess those were the early days when we, you know, thought there'd be flowers on the street and all sorts of things. We didn't. And, and it was a little bit before the insurgency started or that was already the, it, 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 was it was bubbling up already at that point, wasn't it? It, it was bubbling up a bit. I mean, certainly in Alamora, we, we actually and I sort of deliberately went out and sort of caught at the Saar dress and all the people who looked as though they could be troublemakers. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a good relationship uh, with all of them locally. Mm -hmm. So even when they were sort of told from on high to make trouble, it was a little bit half-hearted mm -hmm. um, to the extent that the Sardis then sent in the boys from Najaf. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when it all got mm -hmm. properly quite nasty with sort of RPGs uh, whizzing uh, all over everywhere and mortars falling on the camp and things like that. So it, it definitely got a bit hairier. That was more towards sort of the March, April 2004 time. OK, right before you left to go to Afghanistan, but but sorry, in, in Iraq again, though. So where were you guys all staying? Did you have containers? Is that kind of thing you were? So we were in an old um, Iraqi military barracks. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first room I stayed in was a sort of concrete room that had been blown out. So it had um, no windows, no doors. It was just a sort of shell of a room um, staying on a camp cot. Mm -hmm. And then over fancy. the course of my sort of eight, nine months there, very fancy. And the sort of you know, cockroaches wandering across the floor in yeah. the morning and all other such delights. Um, but by the time I'd been there a bit, we managed to get doors fixed and windows wow. fixed. And, and did they and, do showers and everything? It was hot as hell there. So you we, we did have showers. Um, and because I was one of, I think, about five females on the camp, it was uh, mixed showers, mm -hmm. which was quite interesting. Mm. But with doors, I hope. Uh, one of the shower cubicles had a curtain and I made it very clear as I shouted <laughs> woman on deck at six o'clock every morning that that shower had to be free and I would be using it. <laughs> and then where did you guys all eat? Was there a little mess or something? Yeah, I mean, there's about 1,200 um, of us. Uh -huh. So as I say, sort of all men apart from about five women. Um, so yeah, the mess halls at the end where I became addicted to Sarah Lee mandarin cheesecake. Delicious. I, don't, I don't even know if you can still get that Full nowadays. Of these. But yeah. Yeah, there's something about the US military supplying food to every military base around the world. And they pull out this 1970s food that you can't even buy in grocery stores anymore. Yeah. But you can only get it on bases. Yeah, I mean, if they wheeled out Black Forest Gatto, I would not have been surprised. <laughs> um, but so you were getting a bit of a taste for the slight chaos of these conflict environments yeah. at that point. You obviously realize you had a bit of a skill set for it. Uh, you know, it doesn't, I mean, I've worked in a lot of conflict zones too, and it's interesting. It it's not doesn't go with everyone's personality. I think you just need to be able to deal with chaos a bit yeah. and be comfortable when you don't always know what's going to happen in the next hour or the next day. Even. Yeah. even if you have a plan, everything can, you know, can change. So I think being um, 
uh, flexible with uncertainty, but also just having a sort of roll your sleeves up and getting yeah. on with the job yeah. attitude. So, you right. know, sometimes you do things which were, you know, 17 pay grades above where you were, yeah. but sometimes you kind of had to take your turn to do the horrible smelly jobs that yeah. were about 17 pay grades below you. You just have to pitch yeah. in and do all of it. I also always have, thought, have no ego. Yeah, well, there's, there's all of that, but I also thought too, just, you know, having myself growing up in Alaska and you probably growing up in, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, not in a cosmopolitan city. It made it a little bit easier to work in yeah. different types of environments, maybe. Mm. I'm not sure. but um, And actually the first soldier I met, so I got to uh, Bryce Norton, bless them, my parents came and picked me up and took me to Bryce Norton and dropped me off. And I was, uh, at this point, I was a little bit nervous. I think it was beginning to sink in that I just signed up to go to Iraq, um, having the most exotic place I'd ever been to was a package holiday to Egypt. And otherwise, yeah. I'd not been outside sort of Western Europe. And the first person I spoke to was a private soldier um, who was about only a couple of years younger than me, who lived around the corner from my grandma in South oh, Yorkshire sweet. in Armthorpe. <laughs> uh, and actually, you know, most of the lads out there were the lads yeah. I'd grown up yeah. with. I ran into tons of Alaskans also. It was very funny in yeah. Afghanistan yes. and all sorts. Of, so then you went to Afghanistan. So why were you plucked out after a year? Well, less than a year. I guess about nine months in Iraq. And then why did uh, you go to Afghanistan? So we were only supposed to do six months um, uh -huh. in Iraq, but I'd managed to extend it mm -hmm. because of yeah, you various just reasons. Just starting to understand what's going on. Well, exactly. Right? I mean, yeah. you know, six months was far too short. So I, I managed to extend that to about nine months. And then the cabinet office owned me because technically mm -hmm. you have to be on somebody's books. And mm -hmm. the cabinet office owned me and they rang me up, which was not an easy thing to do in Iraq. Mm hmm and uh, said, oh, we've got this great job for you when you come back, cutting red tape for businesses uh, for the budget 2005, it must have been. And I went, oh, right, cutting red tape for businesses. That sounds very important for somebody else to do. Mm -hmm. And then the Ministry of Defence, and so I then rang up the Ministry of Defence and went, what are you offering? Mm -hmm. And they went, Afghanistan. I'm like, on the next plane. Mm -hmm. So what, what oh, you're another political advisor, this time to an American general. That's right, yeah. So um, there was a British general there who was the number two. Mm -hmm. So this was before NATO um, had sort of fully taken over the international mission in Afghanistan. Um, and the Americans ran the show with something called CFC Alpha, Combined Forces Command Afghanistan. I they think love their called. acronyms, don't they? They do love their acronyms, their TLAs. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Re-letter acronym. Yeah. And then the good point. And then NATO was kind of only a tiny uh, mm -hmm. bit at this point. But yeah, so I got to go and uh, work really cheap by dial with the American military for Who the first time. Who was the general there? Uh, general Barno, Dave Barno. Oh, right. How interesting. And for those who don't know, political advisors are also supposed to figure out what's going on in the local politics and explain it to the general, too. Yeah. So you end up doing almost a daily brief of what's happening in Iraq or what's happening in Afghanistan, yeah. wherever you were. Um, and that's not an easy thing to figure out, is it? It wasn't. Um, and one of the first things I did, actually, when I went to Afghanistan, is I went to see all the relatively junior in terms of hierarchy, people who had been in Afghanistan for absolutely years. But of course, the senior people didn't talk to them because they were quite junior people, but they were only junior because actually they weren't bothered about rank and personally getting ahead. They just loved the country. Yeah. Um, so I actually just made it my mission to go and spend as much time as I could with all of these sorts of people. Um, and this was, of course, the day before smartphones. So there was no WhatsApp groups or anything like that. So it was literally going around to people, having coffee, taking temperature. So I just kind of linked in with all the people who were smarter than me, mm -hmm. who could tell me what was going on. Uh, I'd apply a bit of common sense to how it would all fit together. And then I also traveled around Afghanistan quite a bit. Which on is, your own or with your general? Um, or both, a bit, bit of both, yeah. bit of both, um, and then occasionally I go on trips with the um, the American ambassadors. Ahmed Khalizad uh, took me out to Herat a couple of times, mm -hmm. for example, including mm -hmm. when we uh, he sort of uh, broke the news to Ishmael Khan that he could no longer be uh, in charge of Herat province and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So uh, I got a, a seat at some really interesting yeah. events in our time. Yeah, no, that's always very interesting. When I was in Kosovo in 2000, I befriended the pull ads and they had helicopter rights. So it was great. It was a good way to get around and see things. Yeah. And sort of. Mm -hmm. And one of the key them. things there was 2004 was the Afghan, the first Afghanistan presidential elections. And everyone knew there was sort of only one real candidate mm -hmm. and everyone knew that Kals, um, Karzai. Karzai was going to win. But nonetheless, it was an election it needed to be taken seriously. And one of the things which I'm proudest of is sort of encourage getting the military American military effort to go, we need to swing in logistically support the United Nations because mm -hmm. actually 
delivering ballot boxes around the country had never really been done like that before. Yeah, I mean, I, I, in fact, I was in Afghanistan monitoring some elections many years later, and I think you guys must have figured it out very well because that was not the problem, was getting the ballot boxes out. Yeah. They knew how to do it by then. And then, so at this point, this is still early days in the mission in Afghanistan. Uh, were there, uh, same thing, were those, uh, what were those things called, those... Uh, those setups combined military. Oh, they just started the P PRDs. No, PRTs. P PRTs. Yeah. PRTs. Thank you. Yes, provisional reconstruction teams. teams. Yeah, and so everyone also living in containers, gyms, and all that. Were you? So you were in Kabul, living in. Yeah, so I was based in Kabul, living in a house with uh, a, house. a bunch of colonels. We had a house. Were you in? Uh, not on that base. Were you in town? Because in the early days, people said you could walk around on your own and all sorts of things in town. Yeah, I mean, I I was told that I couldn't um, and I got a British military driver mm -hmm. uh, who would sort of take me and one mm -hmm. of the other colonels that he drove for wherever it was that we needed to go. Um, so I split my time between sort of Afghan ministry meetings. Uh, so my mantra was to meet as many Afghans as I yeah. could uh, rather than just internationals. But we were opposite one of the UN bases, you know, army. Uh, it was just sort of a compound that had got a few houses enclosed in it, basically. Mm -hmm. So we lived there. Uh, and one of my enduring memories is that you could only get hot water if you got up early enough, which meant getting up about five o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I like my sleep. So I had more cold showers in the winter in Afghanistan than I cared for. Yeah, that would not be very pleasant. No. But um, this is before... In spring, actually, spring, yeah. The UN was attacked, right? I mean, there were a couple attacks on some of these UN yeah. compounds. So this is before you... Yeah. There were no big attacks while I was there, uh -huh. thankfully. Uh -huh. So actually, you were able to do some work, which is much more interesting. Yeah. So you were there for six months. Was it the same sort of thing as Iraq, six months in both yeah, places? Yeah, I would happily stay longer, but uh -huh. uh, I was told that my, my time was up and I needed to uh, return to London. And were there things that you were able to do quicker in Afghanistan because you had already figured it out in Iraq, basically? I think so, yes. And understanding what mattered, what didn't matter, sort of what the noise was. Uh, but I think all the time, just kind of questioning, where are we adding value? How are we doing this? You know, we have these very lofty ideals to help support institutions and eradicate the narcotics problem. Yeah, right. And so I think even by 2004, my ambition was tempered and I was the person in the room going, well, we could try and eradicate, uh, you know, drugs in Afghanistan or we could try and do something that's a bit more realistic instead. Yeah, well, that was always a problem I had with that mission for, you know, over the last 18 years now, because it's still going on, is yeah. that the goals kept changing. Yeah. And, you know, building a democracy or getting rid of drugs or just counterinsurgency or no one really ever agreed on what they were doing there. And it's yeah. hard to be successful if you don't actually know why you're there. And I'd always joke, and I'd say two things about the military, actually. One, I am completely in awe of um, our militaries. I think there's some very fine men when yeah. they're doing amazing jobs and where they weren't necessarily getting things right in Iraq, it was not through want of trying and yeah. they were doing their best. Yeah. They just weren't civilian reconstruction people. Yeah. But until the civilian reconstruction people turned up, they were stepping in and doing uh, sort of what sure. they could. But my one criticism uh, would be that every new military, British military general who came in would say, right, people, the next six months are critical. Yeah. And every American general who came in went, right, folks, the next year is critical. Yeah. Um, and of course, that was the length of their tours. Yeah. And it wasn't until we started to get some more enlightened generals who came and went, right, we need a long term plan. Yeah. What are the goals that I'm going to deliver at the front of this or the middle of this or the yeah. end of this long term plan? So I think we started to see a, a change in attitude and yeah. difference. But still overall the strategies were flawed in both places and that's why really we're still struggling today in both countries you still see in Iraq I was just there in November and you still see you know so many challenges that were just caused by a really botched intervention uh, in, you know the, the immediate period after the intervention when the Americans just did not want to plan or adopt the plans that many people had already been making. But yeah. anyway, we don't need to relitigate all of that. But it's just hard to do the job when there are all these great people out there trying to do yeah. it and the overall structure isn't right. right? I, I think, you know, the, uh, the decision to uh, expel anyone who is a sort of level five thurker, it was called, Ba'ath Party member from institutions in Iraq, uh, certainly in down south had us scratching our heads because, mm -hmm. of course, if you wanted to be a head yeah. teacher or even just a, a senior teacher at a school, you had to join the Ba'ath Party. It yeah. didn't 
Mean, you were a paid yeah. up supporter of Saddam Hussein. I mean, these yeah. were Shia. Right. Uh, so by and large, they weren't supporters of Saddam Hussein. Right. But just uh, for me, that was the one strategic thing that had us all scratching our heads in the provinces going, no, yeah, no, right, don't do right. this. Creating the insurgency in many ways. Yeah. So you then had to go back to London after having spent about a year in, in two different countries, uh, two different war zones. And uh, but then they put you in the Iraq policy unit. Right. So. So so I had a moment. So at this point, I decided my future. I really wanted it to be with the Foreign Office, but the Foreign Office had not yet decided that it wanted me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And a chap called John Sawyers uh, was political director in the Foreign Office at the time. He, of course, then went on to be uh, C, the head of SIS, MI6. Um, And I knew John a bit from when he'd been at number 10. I'd been at the Cabinet Office. And I remember literally sort of stuffing my CV into his hands at a... uh, um, garden party in Afghanistan. <laughs> so Mir Vice Yassini, the uh, Canton Narcotics Minister, was hosting a barbecue. And I ran into John there and basically went, remember me, I really want to come back to the Foreign Office. Can you help? Mm-hmm. Um, and John kindly uh, sort of put my CV in the direction of the Afghanistan units and the Iraq units in the Foreign Office. Um, and for me, that was kind of one of those moments of, Actually, you know, I would have liked to have got there on merit, but it was networking yeah. that made the difference yeah. uh, in that I think point. it is merit, always merit, but it's also networking, right? I mean, yeah. it's always going to be a bit of both. You need uh, and it's, you know, it's who you work well with and who you don't work well with mm-hmm. as well. So, yeah. um, so so both units interviewed me and I like to look at the Iraq unit. And uh, so, yeah, I went to do uh, London-based Iraq stuff for what was meant to be two to three years. But in the end, I think it was less than a year because a job came up in the embassy in Baghdad and suddenly sure. I find myself back on an airplane. Out you went again. But now you were fully uh, in the foreign office. Uh, yes, I was by okay. this point. So, okay. so then you went back out and you were a political, military and economics counselor. It sounds like a big portfolio. Uh, it was. And I have to say the economics bit probably got less attention than it should have done, primarily because I was also uh, overseeing quite a few of the hostage rescue cases oh, at wow. the time. Um, 2005 to 2006, September 2005 to October 2006, yeah. right? So we had uh, a couple of high profile cases and some less high profile cases. Uh, and this is when with. also the Brits had Basra, but you were based in Baghdad. That's okay. right, yeah. Got it. Uh, yeah, so tell us about that was actually during the very bad period when lots of uh, troops, international troops were getting killed. It was before the surge. Yeah, so General George Casey was the US commanding general at the time. And I worked very closely with his strategy planners uh, in the American military headquarters, mainly because I knew how to speak American military at this mm-hmm. point, which was a great career advantage right. uh, on the back of the Afghanistan stuff. Uh, and so I worked with his strategy planners and Iraqis actually at their National Security Council. And together we developed something called uh, PIC provincial uh, Iraqi control. And it was a program to work out how we could transfer basically chunks of Iraq back to the Iraqis in Mm -hmm. a way that worked. Mm -hmm. Um, And it sounds slightly colonial when you say it like this, but actually it was looking at, you know, were the politics right? Were the, uh, was the governance more or less in a not bad place, but security kind of okay. Um, And then sort of by province by province with Al-Mathana in the south being the first province, there's a sort of formal ceremony to formally mark Mm -hmm. the departure of um, or the need for permanent international Mm -hmm. military presence there. So it could be handed back over to uh, to the Iraqis. Mm -hmm. And I think it worked quite well. But one of the concerns that we always had with it is that you'd effectively hand the Shia provinces and the Kurdish provinces over, if one can be that crude in characterising mm-hmm. them quite early on, and you would be left with sort of the Sunni insurgency areas, mm-hmm. um, and that would be a problem. And indeed, it is a problem. It was a problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, must have been quite scary, though, too, because you must have known people who were killed, even, and seen attacks and yeah. et cetera, right? I yeah, mean, I mean, not, yeah. But you 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 felt as though you were making a difference. You, know, mm-hmm. you had a purpose, which mm-hmm. was to help get Iraq back to a place or to a mm-hmm. place where it could then go forward and be a mm-hmm. positive member of uh, the international community, which is what the Iraqis wanted and were perfectly capable of doing. Mm-hmm. And then you went back on to the Afghanistan portfolio and spent some time on Petraeus' team when he did that uh, review. Is that correct? That's right, yes. Yeah. So I had um, two and a half years in uh, in London, I think it was, doing Afghanistan mm-hmm. um, work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then London said, oh, we'd quite like you to go and 
joined General Petraeus. He was uh, commander of CENTCOM, um, US Central Command at the time. Um, so a group of us, Brits, few other Five Eyes, nations, Australians, mm-hmm. Kiwis, uh, Canadians, uh, joined this sort of 300-person effort where General Petraeus was basically... So the day I arrived was the uh, 2008 election. Mm-hmm. So I was there when uh, Barack Obama was elected and then I left in the January on the day of his inauguration speech. Okay. And this was all done at National Defence University, right? Yeah, yeah. A mixture of National Defence University and we also had about a month in Qatar and in Afghanistan. Okay. And the purpose was? So the purpose was basically to come up with some policies that General Petraeus could present to a new president, say mm-hmm. this is what I think we need to do on uh-huh. Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh-huh. Huh, interesting. And he was head of CENTCOM right at the time. And I, yeah, okay. So you did that for a while, and then you went and finally got your dream job because you worked at the Ministry of Defense. And uh, they finally, finally accepted the you. <laughs> so I was, I was actually killing time. So I was waiting to go for um, uh, a second attempt at my promotion mm-hmm. uh, exam to the senior civil service. So I'd failed it the first year on the grounds that my leadership style was too directional, uh-huh. uh, which probably shouldn't have been a surprise to me after spending the previous five years with the military, but nonetheless <laughs> showed I've got a bit of work to do on my leadership styles. Um, so I'd spent the last year sort of doing that and saying to my staff things like, I'm going to practice a coaching style this week. And my staff would sort of slightly roll their eyeballs and then were just brilliant at kind of going, no, that's not how we need. That's not what we want from you. This is what we need. (laughs) So good learning experience. But I was basically waiting for the next round to come around for the promotion exams. Uh, And so spotted a job in as chief speechwriter for the Secretary of State for Defence, who was John Hutton uh, at the time. And uh, former chairman of RUSI. Of course, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, so I said to the Foreign Office, I'm going to nip to the MOD for a, a couple of months. Can you just sort out the um, uh, all the HR and the paperwork, please? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I came back to the Foreign Office a few months later and... I'm fairly convinced nothing ever happened. So if you're listening to this foreign office, uh, I think you were paying me when the MOD should have been paying me, but it wasn't that much money. It all comes up at the same pot at the end of the day anyway, doesn't it? Exactly. So what kind of speeches were you writing in 2009 for uh, the Secretary of Defence? Secretary of State. The first one I wrote was uh, about nuclear submarines. So Mm. it's like life had come wherever I went. My nuclear bit kept uh, kept circling back in. Uh, So it was was sort of basically sort of policy speeches Mm -hmm. that he would make. Mm-hmm. Uh, occasionally interventions in the house, things like that. So it was, it was good and it was fun and it was a fascinating insight into the Ministry of Defence, which I'd always assumed if there were only schisms in the ministry, they would be between military and civilians. Mm-hmm. But instead, I was, my eyes were opened up to this world where it's very much about tri-service yeah. deliberations you, around Yeah, you'd issues. already, I mean, it's great. You've had so much experience in all parts of government. So it really does make you a stronger person now. And when you go out to Kenya, actually, that'll really help having worked pretty much across all of Whitehall yeah. and in the field across uh, as so. well. So then you, so then somehow Holbrook found you and called you or did, were you offered by the British Embassy? So Sherard Cooper Coles, who was uh-huh. our British yes. uh, special envoy at the time, rang me and I was actually on holiday in Damascus. Uh-huh. Uh, it's sort of 2009, so before the Arab Spring. Um, and uh, Sherard said, uh, I need to talk to you. I've got a job for you. And I said, Sherard, I love you dearly, but uh, I don't know if I can work for you. And he went, oh, no, 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 not for me, not for me. <laughs> Someone much more difficult to work with than me, uh, which he said with great affection, of course. Uh, and uh, it was Richard Holbrook. So again, two weeks later, suddenly on a, I'm on an aeroplane to Washington to go and be the British embed uh, in Ambassador Richard Holbrook's team, which, of course, is where I met you. Yeah. And, and that was for you did that for about six months as well. That's right. So that's that point, having passed my exams, I was interviewing for the position of Deputy Ambassador in Tehran. Okay. Uh, so I actually got the Tehran job about a week into working with Holbrook. So it's only ever sadly going to be a short term thing. So I, I loved working with him. I loved working with that team. And I'm really glad that we're still was in a touch very, nowadays. Yeah, it was a very dynamic team. I remember watching all of you you did some presentation at a think tank. Was that CSIS? Mm. You were all up on a platform and he was sort of parading his people. Yes. (laughs) And everybody was speaking about something different. I can't remember what your portfolio was, but I remember Sepeda, uh, Kevin Chad, who was the development person and you and a few others that I, uh, Vikram Singh and a few others were all speaking. And it looked very impressive. He was sort of producing this great team, very smart people who were talking about how 
it was all going to work so well. But, you know, he was very good at, 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 at uh, let's just say, pushing the bureaucracy. But I, I think people make a mistake when they think they're stronger than the bureaucracy. And I yeah. think he wasn't able to do that because he was a little bit too aggressive with people. And so eventually the bureaucracy just pushed back on him Yeah, and in all sorts of ways. Uh, I think it's that classic thing of, you know, he had speed and clarity and intent of purpose right. and the sort of personality that, got things done. But yes, uh, fairly on, he sort of hit this bureaucratic uh, wall that said, actually, no, you need to bring in all of these other people who've also got vested interests. And yeah, there just wasn't time for that. There was a country to save uh, in sort of Holbrookian terms. And then Sherrod, meanwhile, was the British special rep for Afghanistan packets. And I remember Sherrod, uh, I was in D.C. at the time and he was, I went to some lunch or dinner with him and he was saying, I'm I'm Holbrook's mini me. That's how he <laughs> described himself. But um, OK, so then you went off to Iran and you were the charge because they you were going to be the deputy ambassador. But- so I was the deputy ambassador when I first went there and for probably about eight, nine months or so. Uh, and then the ambassador at the time, a brilliant man called uh, Simon Gass, whom I learned oh, yes. an awful lot from. Of um, he uh, he left in the in March 2011, must have been. Mm-hmm. So I became the charge for about six, seven months or so before Dominic Chilcott, the new ambassador, arrived mm-hmm. in October 2011. Well, funny, Simon Gass and uh, and uh, John Soros are both affiliated with us here at Rusi, uh, and Sherrod has op- op- you know has often helped us out. And of course, now Dominic is the ambassador in Turkey. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you were in Iran and I think you had to evacuate the embassy. Isn't that right? That's right. Yeah. Tell us what happened. This is in which this is in so this is the 29th of November, 2011. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'd say it was a day that, that began like any other day as the story <laughs> goes, but actually it wasn't. So, uh, the couple of days before the Iranian parliament had voted to expel Dominic uh, Chilcott, the ambassador, who, as I say, had arrived a month earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, He worked out he was the second shortest serving ambassador anywhere. I'm not quite sure who the the shortest (laughs) serving one was. So how many months had he served? Uh, So he served, I think, 31 days Uh um, (laughs) before before he all had to leave. Um, So that had happened on the Sunday. And actually, I was traveling uh, around Iran. I loved Iran. Um, And I loved just sort of, uh, for some reason, I had the freedom to just kind of put my lonely planet in my bag and wander off. Wow. uh, Largely hassle-free, I have to say. Uh, So I spent a lot of time exploring Iran, loved it as a a country. Uh, And I'd always, uh, people would come to me and they'd say, oh, what do you think about Iran? Yeah, the Iranians. And I would say, oh, I said, you know, amazing people, beautiful country and your government. And then I'd sort of do dot, dot, dot. And then I'd wait and see how they would react Mm -hmm. as to whether they completely didn't want a political conversation Mm -hmm. at all because it was too dangerous um, or whether they would want to talk about it. And you learned a lot of surprising things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, grassroots support for President Ahmadinejad genuinely seemed to be there. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, which you don't get when you're stuck in your office in, in Tehran. Right. Uh, so I was actually visiting the uh, the ancient Elamite uh, empire seat at Shush mm. um, uh, near Avaz in western uh, Iran when the parliament vote happened. Uh, Dominic was uh, expelled, I was told he would be expelled. I rang him up and went, shall I come back to um, Tehran? He said, yes, please. So I got on the next plane back. Uh, and then all of this stuff was going about whether Dominic would actually be expelled, whether the Parliament Majlis vote would be followed through or not. And uh, and then we knew there was going to be a big demonstration on Tuesday the 29th of uh, November because it was the one year anniversary since the assassination of a nuclear scientist, mm-hmm. uh, which the Iranians had chosen to believe uh, the UK may have been involved with, which we weren't, but they Mm -hmm. like to pretend these sorts of things. Uh, And so there's a big demonstration that was planned. And I think there's various interpretations of what happened. Um, I think they intended to give us a bit of a bloody nose. I think it got out of control. Mm -hmm. And essentially 1979 style, the embassy, um, both our compounds, actually not just the one where the embassy was, were overrun with uh, the mob, basically. And they set the building we were in on fire. Um, so we tried to put the fire out, couldn't do that because we couldn't get to the fire, uh, ended up uh, escaping through the back door, 
uh, into the compound where there was a mob rampaging around who weren't under anyone's control, uh, attempted to sort of run to safety, but ran into two Iranians who I think were uh, security forces in some way, shape or form. And I remember them going, Hulume Marriott, Hulume Marriott, Mrs. Marriott, Mrs. Marriott. And then they're like, which one are you? And I thought Mm -hmm. to myself, well, there's only two women. And um, so it's not that much of a guess. Uh, And we ended up hiding out at the back of the club for I thought it was about eight hours, something like that at the end, while this mob rampaged around the compound. So these guys protected you? So Yeah, I mean, they didn't want anything to happen to us. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I thought uh, one of my colleagues summed it up quite well when uh, she went from... um, oh my goodness, we're all going to die. And Mm -hmm. that's a stage where genuinely, you know, we didn't know how this was going to end. Um, To, oh my God, we're going to be kept hostage. How long were the Americans kept hostage for? You know, somebody unhelpfully went 444 days. That (laughs) didn't help the mood at all. Uh, And then... um, uh, once it was all over, she's like, well, am I going to get my kitchenware back? I mean, did they destroy everything in my kitchen or can I get my kitchenware back? Uh, and for me, that's just a really good evolution yeah, right. of human brain and human right. thinking from am I going to die to I really like my saucepans. Right. And did any of the staff get hurt? Um, so uh, some, particularly on the compound up in North at Gullhack, there were some, uh, a couple of bad experiences with uh, people who I think were genuinely uh, in fear of their lives, who'd been mm-hmm. sort of slightly separated from colleagues and got hold of by mm-hmm. Uh, the mob, who did assure them that they weren't going to be killed. But frankly, when a mob breaks into your right. safe room right. going, don't worry, we won't kill you, I, you don't necessarily believe them straight right. away. And you, had, you must have had Iranian local stuff too that you were worried about. We did. So we'd evacuated um, or sort of closed the embassy down early so all of the Iranian staff had gone home other than the security guards. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we'd always told the security guards, you know, as soon as anyone comes over yep. the wall, scatter to the winds. Take part of the demonstration mm-hmm. if you have to do mm-hmm. to get out safely. Because, you know, frankly, a handful of security guards, yeah. they're not going to be able to help us. Yeah. All they're going to do is get themselves injured in the way between the mob and us. Yeah. And so then how did you get out of the country? Uh, so, I mean, I was then working the phones with the foreign ministry and every other contact I could think of mm-hmm. to say, look, I don't know what you guys intended to happen, mm-hmm. but this is what happened. And indeed, the foreign ministry, when I first rang them, I said, you know, were worried, you know, the right police haven't come, they're coming over the wall, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and the contact on the other end, quite a senior Iranian foreign ministry person just kind of went, no, 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 it's fine. No, 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 the, 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 the right police will deploy soon. I'm like, no, you don't understand. They've got over the wall and they set the building on fire. Yeah. And there was the sort of farsi equivalent of, oh, insert swear word, <laughs> uh, I'll get back to you. Uh, and I think from that point, bits of the Iranian bureaucracy were working very quickly uh-huh. to uh, make sure that we weren't harmed uh-huh. because this had got out of hand and not what they were intending. Um, so finally, the the mob was cleared out of the compound about sort of 10 o'clock at night. And I remember shooing some of the last sort of CG and Iranians out of the uh, the gates of the, uh, the embassy. Uh, and then the following morning, we got on a plane and mm. left wow. under orders from London to uh, uh, draw down, not to sever diplomatic ties, but to withdraw all staff. And indeed, if you look at the history of UK-Iran relations since 79, it's a history of going down to Sharjah, temporarily yeah. closing the embassy, etc. How long did it stay closed after that? Uh, it reopened in 2015. Mm-hmm. Mm. Interesting experience. And so then they decided you needed to come back and join the National Security Council. 2012. So I, I was then in a bit of a limbo, actually. I mm-hmm. didn't really know what to do. I wasn't anticipating finishing mm-hmm. in Tehran. I literally had no job to go to. I applied to be ambassador in North Korea because uh, I figured I'd do the entire access of evil and be yeah, one of the few diplomats yeah. who'd done it. Uh, and was told by the office that that wasn't a good use of my skills, but they then didn't say what would be a good use of my skills. Uh, and a chap called uh, Hugh Powell, who was working in the cabinet office at the time, just went, why don't you come and work in the cabinet office? We need someone who knows about Iran. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he sort of saved me from career limbo. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I went to sort of initially do Iran-related stuff at the cabinet office, National Security Council, but then ended up running sort of Middle East, Africa, America's uh, bit for the best part of a year uh, until I went to Yemen. Mm -hmm. And you went out as ambassador. I did. That's very exciting. Pretty young to be an ambassador, right, at the time, 2013? Yeah, I think so. I mean, not the youngest, Uh um, but but, but fairly young. First women from this country to be ambassador in Yemen? or No, no? Francis Guy had tra- oh, okay. blazed that trail uh-huh. uh, about a decade earlier uh-huh. uh, and indeed was still a legend in um, 
uh, in Yemen terms and had a school named after her and all sorts of things. I mean, Yemen is such an incredible place. I went out there a few years before that. But of course, you went out just before the Civil War started, basically. So you were there from July 2013 to April 2015. And I think you again had to evacuate, didn't you? Yeah, February 2015, we ended up leaving. So I evacuated Yemen twice. So of course, by this point, I was beginning to get a reputation as uh, the right. woman you don't want to work with because right. you'll end up, right. you'll, you'll guaranteed excitement, but also possibly too much. Excitement. There's a cause and effect question yeah, people yeah, might ask about yeah. Jane. Uh, so we evacuated the uh, embassy about three weeks after I got there because of some threat reporting from mm-hmm. Al Qaeda, um, and that was only a sort of week long. Uh, temporary Mm -hmm. drawdown basically until the reporting until we were no longer concerned or as concerned and then yeah so most of my time in Yemen obviously our main remit was a sort of counter-terrorism one working with uh, the Yemeni counter-terrorism forces for AQAP uh, Mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula who are the guys who got very good at perfecting non-metallic improvised explosive devices which is why you have to take all of your uh, liquids out on an aeroplane for Mm -hmm. example and have your shoes checked that's a legacy of uh, what the Al-Qaeda boys Mm -hmm. in Yemen were up to and uh, so that was the mainstay of the mission but actually the politics was the thing and a big DFID mission uh, development mission there as well but the politics were the main thing Uh, Jamal Ben Amar was the uh, UN UN guy guy at the time um, putting in sterling effort into trying to support the yeah. national dialogue process. Yeah. Uh, and there was That's right, the national dialogue, which was actually quite successful, wasn't it? I was just, just, there was a time yeah, when we were actually really quite hopeful and yeah. optimistic yeah. Uh, about Yemen. Not naively, I don't think, actually. Yeah. I think there was a series of um, events and a series of decisions that were made that we in the international community did say, are you sure those are a great idea? So the number of uh, the ways in which Yemen was going to be made into a federal province, for example, Mm -hmm. sort of isolated the Houthis, who until that point had been participating in the democratic um, And then what happened? Ali Abdullah Saleh then joins up with the Houthis. Was, was, I mean, who... What what sort of inspired it to go in a different direction? So I think there was definitely disillusionment from the Houthis who mm-hmm. thought who had participated in a political process in good faith mm-hmm. and then felt as though they had been screwed over, mm-hmm. uh, technical term. And I, I do have a bit of sympathy um, mm-hmm. for them. But they'd also been receiving visitors from a certain Middle East country right. uh, at that point who'd been putting ideas in their head that uh, uh, they could be even more. Uh, and we knew that weapons and things were starting to go from Iran at that point to uh, to the Houthis. And then Ali Abdullah Saleh and Wanted his boys back, basically. You know, were like, you know, who is this president who's in charge of Yemen? That should be me. I want to come back yeah. and form this alliance, which... I mean, the question was always, when will the alliance between Houth, the Houthis and Saleh split? Yeah. No one thought it could ever right. endure. And indeed, it, was, it, it didn't endure in the end. And the Houthis uh, ended up uh, killing Saleh, I think is my understanding. But mm. it last, that alliance lasted longer. The, mm-hmm. the mutual interest lasted longer than we thought it would. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, by February 2015, I've been sort of jumping up and down for a while going, hello, we've got a problem. Mm-hmm. There's sort of impending civil war, but worse. Mm-hmm. Um the regional powers are starting to be involved. And once they get involved, it's going to get an yeah. awful lot worse. Right. Um, and whilst most people now might not care that much about Yemen, we're all going to be forced to care about Yemen. Yeah. Um, and that, I know that in every conflict, it is the people who suffer. But yeah. dear God, the Yemenis yeah. um, are suffering disproportionately. Right. I mean, had you an opportunity to visit the country before that because it is a stunningly beautiful place. Did you, were you able to get around or was it just too difficult to... A, a bit, not as much as I would mm-hmm. like. So I sort of travelled sort of around Sana province a bit. I got out to the coast in Hodeida, mm-hmm. Ib, Taiz, Aden, down in the south. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just absolutely remarkable. A yeah. beautiful country, incredibly hospitable people, if you can generalise uh, that much about a people. And an absolute, yeah, tragedy. When I was there, I was there in 2000 and. I think 2007 for the elections, presidential elections. Mm-hmm. 2007, is that right? Um, but we, I remember hearing all these stories. This is before AQAP was really a threat. Um, and stories about Westerners who wanted to be kidnapped in Yemen because they got treated so well by the kidnappers. And so they'd go wandering around these villages. And uh, when they'd be, the negotiation when the Yemenis would kidnap somebody, it was always about, we want water and schools. It yep. was not about money for no. the family. It was actually about public services. And then they would get a little gift when yes. <laughs> they were returned. You know, of course, it all changed when, when Al-Qaeda 
really penetrated that place. But yeah, just a very interesting, different place. Yeah. And you you had sort of like in the late 1990s and things, other sort of bad hostage experiences. Yeah. But yeah, by and large, the experience of being a hostage in Yemen was you right. went to stay in a village right. uh, and after two, you were treated like a king. And after two right. or three days, you went, that's fantastic. But my backpack and I now need to be on our way. And your host would say, ooh, actually terribly sorry, hate to break it to you, but you're actually a hostage um, because we're trying to negotiate, as you say, right. for this well down the road right. or some salary for our school teachers or a right. school or something right. like that. Very different. Um, so yeah. yeah, different experience from your normal hostage experience. Right, right. So then is when you came, oh, you came back to the Foreign Office to be the Joint Director of Middle East and North Africa, right? Yes. And was that just a placeholder again while you were looking for another job or? Uh, no, that was, uh, I was meant to do that for about uh, three years and my portfolio oh, okay. was uh, sort of most of North Africa and the Gulf. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did that, traveled around the Middle East a bit with the Foreign Secretary, who was um, Philip Hammond at the time. Um, and yeah, generally uh, very much enjoyed that job. But then they were setting up this Joint International Counterterrorism Unit uh, and we were looking a bit senior top heavy on mm-hmm. the Middle Eastern side. Uh, so, uh, so I ended up moving over to create this unit, this Joint International Counterterrorism Unit. I guess I figured you had more interagency experience than most people in yes. government at that point. So you were the first director of this JICTU, uh, which was launched in April 2016. So you really helped design the 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 way that the foreign office and the home office were, work together, obviously in recognition that you can't distinguish between international and national yeah. terrorism anymore. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, and working with Cross Whitehall and international partners. Yeah, and this was, of course, when ISIL was uh, still really a, a threat. Yeah, uh, and so you were watching, probably from the peak of of ISIL strength in Syria and Iraq to you know to its demise, at least territorially. Oh, yeah. We were, but in our bureaucratic uh, wisdom, mm-hmm. uh, ISIL was still being run through the Middle Eastern shop okay. rather than through the counterterrorism people. I see which I think is a very interesting point for UK government and and others, which is at what mm-hmm. point does an insurgency become a terrorist threat? Yeah. And I think had we, you know, if you, uh, it was sort of with the Middle Eastern people because it started out as an insurgency and then sort of remained with them and then morphed into our sort of counter-ISIL um, work. So we worked very closely with them, but were slightly different until we absorbed the counter-ISIL work. Yeah, because um, they were attacking in the UK and they were yeah, cutting exactly. up hostages' heads and including Britain's. Yeah. Yeah, so you'd have to get, yeah. Yeah, but our our real aim of of that was, as is so often in um, government, it's very, the the impetus and momentum is to think in sort of short-term chunks. Mm -hmm. Um, And the two things that I really, really wanted to do with JICTU was to, one, get us to think long-term, by which I meant sort of five to 20 years. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you'd think beyond that, but actually five to 20 is fairly revolutionary uh, uh, sometimes. Um, And secondly, to think about counterterrorism in a different way and to think about it almost as as an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Because it's very easy to run after where the terrorism ball is uh, at any given moment. But actually, if you can future-proof, if you can... build resiliency into the system. Yeah, build resilience into the the global system, um, develop those partnerships now that we think we might need Mm -hmm. further down the line. Um, That's the sort of thing... Uh, someone said to me once, and I, I, I'm bringing it back to the Iranian uh, Iranians, I'm afraid, but somebody said to me once, you know, Jane, why is it that the Iranians always um, seem to be in the right place at the right time? How do they get there so quickly? Mm-hmm. How do yeah. they get there so quickly? And I said, well, it's, it's not that they get there so quickly. It's that they're there beforehand. Yeah. Um, and I used to call it spread betting uh, in Afghanistan, where you see the yeah. Iranians snuggling sure. up to everybody of every political yeah. hue. Right. And they play the long game like the Chinese do. And they do. play the long right. game. Um, and basically that's what I wanted us to do yeah. in counterterrorism, yeah. um, so that it's it's really difficult to go from zero to one, but it's really easy yeah. to go from one to 10 to 100 to 1,000 to scale up uh, when you need that. So my ambition for counterterrorism is in the sort of 40 countries or so where... Uh, we think there are terrorism, counterterrorism interests. You make sure you're at a minimum of a one yeah. at any given moment. So you have those relationships. So when something goes wrong or ideally you can see that something might go wrong, you've already got that initial yeah. investment that enables you to build on it. I mean, the issue that I'm worried about, and I know you are as well, is all of these uh uh, let's just say foreign fighters and their families yeah. now that are being held in northern Syria. And it seems the international community is being a bit ostrich-like, let's just say, in terms of 
what to do about all these people. And I know several countries have said we're not going to send in people to these camps to pull back our nationals. But if they can make it home, then we'll prosecute them. But leaving them in no man's land is also not. Yeah. Obviously, the way to prevent a future. Yeah. I think the challenge challenge. with this is that there are no good answers. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are are only a scale of really bad to really quite bad Mm -hmm. um, scale of answers. So whether that's leaving them in no man's land, bring them back to the UK. I mean, ideally, you want to be able to prosecute for crimes that uh, they have committed. But, you know, that has to be done in a rigorous evidence-based yeah, right, fashion. Right. And there are somewhere between 40 and 50,000 foreign fighters around the world who've gone to Iraq and Syria. Right. So that's a scale that's I know completely unprecedented. It is enormous, but it seems like doing nothing is also worse than that. But I, know, I agree with you. It's an enormous challenge. Um, yeah. And, and I, you know, you look at uh, some of these people and think, yeah, you are, you are the terrorists of the future. Yeah, exactly. Um, and every... It, to me, terrorism isn't rocket science. It's cyclical. It's ideological. Right. You can see how this happens. You look at how the sort of Al Qaeda wave came out of Afghanistan, right. how it's built right. on in the Balkans, Chechnya. Yeah, right. Chechnya. Uh, and I think what we'll see coming out of Iraq and Syria are the next generations, right. Right. because actually you've got kids now who are sort of steeped in ISIS uh, ideology, yeah. including in those formative years. Um, who know nothing else. So even if only a small percentage of them decide that their career choice is global jihadi, it's still enough people to worry about. Of course. And in fact, in that camp in northern Syria, Al-Hall or Hall, whatever it's called, I think there's something like 78,000 people. They say two thirds are children and one third are the mothers. So this is not the foreign fighters, but it's their families. And uh, that's, you know... Anyway, it's a, a longer conversation, yeah. but it's certainly something to worry about. And those women certainly have agency. I think the, the, the concern is that if you ever get into seeing, one well, ever gets into seeing the men as the problem, one is missing so oh, much yeah. of the no, big I picture, agree isn't it? And I know you and I have discussed yeah. this before yeah. and, and agree that the, sort of the women and the children are just as important. Right. Um, They're not in innocent, let's ways. just say. I, I mean, yeah, there's a whole sort of, you know, ch- children are innocent debate, but what you see in your formative years shapes you. Yeah. But certainly the women are not innocent. Well, I, I like to think they have agency. Right, right. Yeah, right. They, they chose, chose to go, to go out, out there. Out there right. uh, and Maybe they, they were yeah. stupid. But but and, and I think some of the ones that are in these camps are really still the hardcore because they could have left beforehand and they really stayed till the bitter end. I, it, there's a, a point early on where it was easy to get out. It then became much more difficult yeah, um, that's true to too. get out. No, so, that's true and you, you don't know the individual circumstances. That's true. Uh, but all I can say is I think that we are storing up future terrorist problems right. but having said that even as a counter-terrorism person i don't think we should get over disproportionately excited about terrorism it is a threat mm-hmm. it will always be there it needs to be managed but actually the big issues of our time are things like social polarization uh climate change yeah. hostile state right. activity you know those are the things that, right. that we actually really keep need it, to be focusing keep it on. in proportion right yeah so we're coming near the end of this very interesting conversation i just want to mention a few more things and then ask you a few more final questions if that's okay mm-hmm. so i know you've been uh uh, you've been honored with the OBE for your work in Iraq. You had a U.S. Superior Civilian Service Medal for your work in Afghanistan yeah. and additional medals for your work in Iraq and Afghanistan. And obviously, you are really an expert now in crisis management, political military affairs and counterterrorism, right? Um, so it's it's actually quite a wide array of issues uh, can prepare you for anything. And of course, Kenya uh, as your next job will be really quite fascinating. Kenya seems to go from being, uh, let's just say, sometimes people think of it as, you know, the, the 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 darling of East Africa and other times people think it's about to collapse, but somehow Kenya keeps uh, going on. It's quite an extraordinary yeah. country. I've lived there. I really have a huge fondness for the country and the people. Uh, and, uh, but of course, a, a number of challenges, not to mention the fact that they're right next to Somalia and, you know, there's a, the Al Qaeda slash Shabab threat that has now infiltrated lots of Kenya and now has yeah. ethnic Kenyans that are part of Shabab. Uh, so, you know, a lot of your skill set will <laughs> come in handy in Kenya. Of course, you'll be dealing with many other things, super vibrant civil society, really tech savvy. Yeah. I mean, all that's really exciting. And, you know, the young generation are really making a difference there. Uh, so that'll be a really interesting, and I am very much looking forward to coming visiting you out there. 
Yeah, I'm uh, really looking forward to it, I have to say. It, it looks like a, a great job and working with great people. And uh, when I've told people where I'm going, if they've had any connection with Kenya at all, all they've said are really positive things. Yeah. Whereas, of course, I'm used to going to postings where people go, yeah. oh, you're going to insert X. That will be pause interesting. <laughs> right. Whereas this right. time it's like, you're going to Kenya. That's brilliant. Right, right. So uh, looking forward to hearing how all of that goes. So I guess just uh, I'm not going to ask you about Brexit because I think that's too torturous. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you about Trump uh, because we are running out of time. But um, one of the ways that we like to end these podcasts is uh, is you know offering advice for the next generation. And you know I, I realize you were probably uh, you were an early adopter. You were uh, you know one of the few women, even though you're still very young. You're still one of the few women who. Yep. made the choices that you made. Yep. Um, but I guess what advice would you offer to not just younger women, but just younger people interested in yep. getting into foreign affairs more generally? I think my my key bit of advice would be don't take advice from one person, particularly when it's careers advice. So go out, ask several people because everybody's biased by their own experience and thinks that their own path is absolutely the best one that everyone should follow. And of course, the answer is you will make your own paths. Um, so, so look at all the different options that are out there. Information is your friend. That's much more easy to access than when I was trying to look at uh, uh, careers choices. Uh, so I think there's there's that. I'm a person who I'm a classic ENTJ on the Myers-Briggs, so I always like a plan. Mm -hmm. But what's been really important to my career is then also being able to tear up that plan with zero notice when new information comes along and drawing up a new plan. So yeah. I always have to have a plan. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, that bridges the how do you do your sort of long term career plotting mm -hmm. uh, so you don't just wake up one morning and go oh my god where did my life go mm -hmm. uh, but equally you also still live in the moment and appreciate mm -hmm. uh, what it is that you've got there and then um, so I think that would be my my main things um, failure is your friend mm -hmm. so you know if we'd done this as a podcast on all the times that you've failed Jane we could have filled it quite mm -hmm. easily um, so as ever it's all about uh, resilience about picking yourself up dusting yourself down learning the lessons of why you failed or why something failed around you that meant you couldn't achieve what you wanted mm -hmm. to achieve um, and understanding that actually that's what makes you a good leader. Mm -hmm. So people who have risen to the top and there, I suspect there are very few of them um, with you know, sort of zero obstacles in the way actually ultimately won't succeed because they don't know how to handle failure. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something I see with some of the um, younger millennials who are fantastic as a, as a group as they come through the foreign office and others, um, that sometimes they haven't experienced that much failure. Mm -hmm. uh, and so some of the mentees I work with, I almost encourage them to push themselves right. to the point where they fail mm -hmm. and then learn from that right. and learn from themselves how they respond in those scenarios. Then they can build on that and go forward. Yeah, no one would accuse you of being a snowflake, Jane. That is true. <laughs> well, Jane Marriott, uh, High Commissioner to Nairobi, doesn't need uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a really fascinating conversation. We could have talked for hours, but we have to end it here. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Karen, for all the amazing stuff you're doing with Rusi. I'm such a fan. Thank you. Thank you. This podcast was produced by Tom Ascott, developed by Caroline Tranter, with further research from Neil Watling. Keep up to date with the latest defense and security analysis by visiting www.rusi.org.